Welcome to Fresh Wind 2004. I'm glad you all arrived safely. I'm glad your air, airplanes didn't crash and your cars didn't crash. Uh, we're glad that you're here and uh, we want to officially welcome you and we want to officially open Fresh Wind 2004. My name's Duncan Smith. Uh, I'm the Executive Director at TACF here, this church, and also together with my wife Kate Smith, we, you'll, we'll be introducing ourselves again in a moment, um, we're the youth pastors here too. So, I've just got one quick announcement to make before we go any further at all, okay? Everybody have a look at the floor, have a look at that carpet, see that carpet? That carpet cost us a lot of money. And so we like to look after it. How many of you know that God wants us to look after things? Right? Okay, so I'm just going to ask you to, uh, to be very kind to us, not to eat, not to drink, and most of all, not to chew gum. And I love chewing gum, so it's a tough one for me. But anyway, please no gum in the sanctuary. Other than that, I want you to promise me one thing. Would you open up your hearts to God and expect to have the best three days of your entire life? All right? Yeah! Woo! Okay. Okay, it, it is my privilege and honor to hand over to you uh, Bill Fish, who's one of my friends, who's a great friend, and his band, the TACF Youth Band, part of the TACF Youth Band. I'm going to let him introduce them over the next uh, couple of sessions. And please, just one more little announcement. No bongos, no drums, no tambourines, okay? <laughs> so if you're one of those aspiring drummers, I don't know, just enjoy watching this awesome drummer over here, okay? So, All right, God bless you. Bill, take it away. All right, welcome everybody. Just quickly, this guy, a good friend of mine, Stephen, Nathaniel, that's Rob, and that's Justin. So feel free at any point in the conference when you see them to uh, stop them and say hi. I'm sure they'll, they'll appreciate it. Uh, so you're ready to give God what he deserves? All right, let's start off. Yes, I will follow, I will follow, I will follow, I will 
ready to go deeper? Go deeper, but I don't know how to swim. 
I'm hidden in your heart. I don't know all that you show me. How I ache for where you are. It's
this is life. You are all over. You are around. You are inside. This is life. This is life. You are all over. You are around. You are inside. This is life. This is life. You are all over. You are around. You are inside. This is life.
Did you? <laughs> oh. Well, you're going to see a whole bunch of things that you didn't know could happen. But that's okay. We don't mind, do we? Woo! Fire on you, young man. Who? Oh. Fire on you just to match that red. And you, son. Is that Judah? Judah. Shikarama. Come on, let's give Peter a hand! Woo! <laughs> Judah is an awesome young man of God. His parents are phenomenal pastors, and uh, part of this house of Toronto, they've moved down to Stratford, Ontario to... Uh, Come on! To uh, pastor down there, they're the senior pastors of Jubilee Church in Stratford. And uh, Judah, phenomenal young man of God, it's awesome to see you. You're so welcome. I pray that you will be absolutely set on fire. And you'll go back mm, unrecognizable to anybody who know, who's known you before. God bless you. Thank you. Do you want to say hi to everybody? Hello? <laughs> Yeah. Okay, well, we're the Smiths. We make absolutely no apology for the fact that everybody in the world seems to want to copy our last name. <laughs> but uh, my name's Duncan, and my wife's name's Kate. We're the youth pastors of Toronto Airport Christian Fellowship. It's our honour. <laughs> you see a whole bunch of mad people around the middle, around the, around the, uh, around the, what do you call it, sound desk. That's the uh, youth network here at CHCF. Well, you guys are also welcome. Uh, youth pastors and leaders, you may now go upstairs, please, to... Uh, to the leaders track that we're running throughout uh, this conference. We want to, uh, we believe that God has a whole bunch of wonderful things that he wants to impart to you 
uh, youth leaders and pastors, things that God's done here in the House of Toronto, but also uh, in other places. Uh, Pastor Steve Osmond um, he's, and uh, his wife are going to be ministering up there as well, uh, as well as Kate and myself and uh, a few others. So, if you're a youth leader or pastor, please make your way up to the top. The announcements that we're going to make, you're going to hear them too up there, so rather than waste any time. You may all be seated. Please return to your seats. Okay, that's great. Well, how many of you think that that was a fantastic start? Wasn't that awesome? I, to be honest with you, um, Kate and I have been here for four years, and I don't think in the four years that we've been here that we've, we've ever seen such a, like, kick-off, uh, you know, from the very get-go at any conference, including Catch the Fire, which, you know, is... Is, uh, it's like our signatory conference in October. You guys, you're totally up for worship, aren't you? And then, then you, I get to see that there's a whole stack of passionate lovers of God. If you believe that you're a passionate lover of Jesus Christ, I want you to just jump right up off of your blanket and your comfort zone and give him a big shout of praise. Yeah! Yeah! We love you, Jesus! We love you, Jesus! Yeah! Woo! Wow. Jesus, you get all the glory and we love you with all our hearts. Honey, over to you. We have a few announcements to give. Um, this might seem like the boring part, but they're really important anyway. So, if you could just Quieten down your voices so that you can hear and so that you will understand the instructions over the weekend. Some of them we will iterate again, but we're just going to give a few of them now. We, you probably noticed we have a reserved seating area here and over there. We ask you kids and, and some of you others and leaders that you would just respect the seating arrangements. The seating over here is for the speakers, the bands, the people that have been doing the organizing behind the scenes, and we just want to honor them for their contribution to the conference. Yeah, let's give them a hand. Come on. Good. We just want to encourage you not to leave your valuables um, on the floor when you leave the auditorium. We don't want to be responsible for you losing your bus fare home or anything like that. So please take things with you and any lost and found items, um, there is a place that you can actually retrieve them. But we don't want to tempt people to steal either. And at the end of the evening, we'd like you to take all your belongings home with you, your blankets, and then come back tomorrow and find your spot again. So please, if you could respect that, and then the clean-up crew are able to clean up for us and make it nice for tomorrow. And if you can remember, just to respect each other's blankets and possessions on the blankets, and, you know, don't tramp your muddy shoes all over them, and just respect that that's somebody's seating area too. Appreciate that. Okay, now for those of you who are responsible for parking in your groups, there are three areas for parking. We've got our own lot here. We have Ten Marmac, which is... Where's Ten Marmac? Uh, just, um, is it School of Ministry? <laughs> the School of Ministry, which is up Marmac Drive. I just didn't realize you were number 10. So we have Marmac up there, and we also have another, another company across the road on Mar Marmac called Synex Lot. And that is available for this evening over the weekend. So obviously not at this time because people are still in work over there. It's a company that is allowing us to use some of their parking spots. So if you can park in the reserve bays up at that place and just let's keep it nice for them so when they come back next week, they'll think we've done a great job. 
Okay. Now, some of you are taking meal plans while you're here, um, and some of you have purchased those already. Um, the, the meals are going to be served after the sessions, again, at the School of Ministry up in Marmac, on Marmac Drive. So if you can give yourself time just to get up there so you don't miss your meal, um, food will be served at 12.30 and 5.30, and it's about a, a five-minute drive walk rather walk it's not too cold to walk thankfully and um, if you're in if you need to drive up there for any reason um, you'll be up there very quickly so I think that's okay, what I honey, need to say for um, now okay we have a snack area how many of you are glad that we have a snack area and like a few of those potato chips I heard one of the one of the some musician uh I think it was one of my friends telling me that if they ate a bag of potato chips before they sang, it lined their, lined their throat and their vocal cords with oil. And I thought, mate, that's the biggest excuse for potato chip eating I've ever heard in my life. That sounds great. I'll remember that What one. about the Holy Spirit? Can't he put oil on your vocal cords? <laughs> well, that's a good point, honey. Exactly. Holy Spirit. Yeah, well, we, we, do, um, we do like the Holy Spirit, but we do like potato chips too, I have to say. Okay. All right, the snack bar will be open at 8.30 in the mornings, and, but it does close at 12 o'clock. Um, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I've misread that. It opens at 8.30 and is open all day until 12 a.m. that night. Except, everybody say except. Except during the sessions. Okay, so if you want to go get a Coke... In the middle of the session, I'm afraid the snack bar will be shut. So, don't bother getting up in the first place. And uh, if you guys don't mind, um, it's actually extremely annoying for people who are sitting behind the thoroughfare just there, if people are walking backwards and forwards during the meeting. So, I would like to ask you, uh, once the worship finishes, um, if you guys want to take your, place, your places, your seats, and uh, if you do need a washroom break, make it quick. Uh, but get ready so that when we start preaching or when we start doing the announcements or the main part of the meeting uh, or the speaking part of the meeting begins and people have sat down, at that point, if we can try to minimize as much walking around as possible for the sakes of the people that are behind and uh, just because we don't want it to be uh, some kind of cattle market. Okay. All right, ministry times. During the sessions... During the sessions, please listen to the speakers on the MC and the MCs. That's me and Kate uh, for, for now. That's the equivalent of what we're doing. That's what the MC is, for those of you that don't know. The people that are sort of, you know, hosting the meeting in the, uh, for that particular meeting. Listen to the speakers and the MCs on what to do during ministry times, okay? Our prayer ministry team, they do have badges, pink badges, and they'll be moving around to assist you, all right? And uh, we want this to be a safe place for you to receive. And for this reason, we're asking that, um, that you respect uh, what the people with the pink badges ask you to do. Now, we are going to be uh, making it slightly different, this fresh wind, and uh, we're gonna, you're going to hear about that tonight. Uh, I'm going to hand over to uh, Lindley Allen, who heads up our ministry team, and she's going to explain tonight how we're going to be doing things slightly differently, and I believe really excitingly, it's an exciting step forward uh, in terms of ministry team. Um, but we are going to, the, the ministry team are all badged up, and uh, in the past they were the people that would be the only people allowed to pray. Well, this year we are going to do it slightly different, so listen up tonight when that announcement comes very, very carefully. Um, but they will be walking around just making sure that this is a safe place and that people are praying for each other in the way that we've asked and that sort of thing, okay? So if you don't, you guys okay to listen to them? You okay if we teach you how to minister a little bit? Is that okay? All right, because we, we don't want to hold on to that. We want to give it away because that's what this church is all about. It's all about walking in God's love and then giving it away to Toronto and the world. So we love to give away what we have. All right, so, okay, now... Um, during some of the sessions, uh, you, guys, your hearts are going to be really touched. And many of you are going are to experience some really awesome healing in your innermost beings. 
And uh, this, this conference is not all about the excitement, you know, rah-rah. We do love that too, but also we want you to, to go away from here having experienced a deep experience of your Heavenly Daddy's love in your life. Okay, that's, that's really what we most want for you and desire and covet for you and pray for, is that you will, while you're here, meet with your Heavenly Daddy, you'll meet with Jesus, and you'll become intimate friends with the Holy Spirit. And so, during those times, some of you have come with very, very deep wounds, some things that have happened to you have been really, really harsh in life, and uh, God's going to help you get through a whole bunch of stuff this week. But there's going to be some of you that have got really, really deep issues, maybe some deliverance and that sort of thing, and... uh, Unfortunately, in one conference, you may not be able to make it 100% through. How many of you know that, in actual fact, we're probably, when we die, even if we're 90 years old, we're still not 100% there yet, right? In fact, the last step into being 100% there is death, right? Which isn't really death anyway, it's just falling asleep when you're in Jesus. Ha! No! So, I would like to ask you that if you... If God begins to initiate some deep, some, a deep work in your life, that you share that right away with your pastors and uh, people that you trust, so that when you go back from here, you can continue to minister, have them minister into those deep issues, okay? All right. Ho. Oh. I think that's pretty much it, honey. Okay, well, this afternoon, we felt that instead of offering you the um, so-called expert speakers, we would give you speakers that we believe are just as anointed. They may not be well known to you, but they're well known to Kate and I, and we consider them to be filled with the expert himself, Holy Spirit. And so, I believe that we have a real treat for you this afternoon. We're going to give you four of our youth, four of our youth and young adults, oh, that are here at TACF. And instead of the big name speakers for the first session, you're going to get the no names filled with a big guard speakers. Oh. I'd like to be a no-name for the rest of my life on earth, but be a big name in heaven, wouldn't you? You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? So, guys, Kate and I are going to hand over uh, right away to to those speakers. And uh, I believe it's going to be a real treat for you this afternoon. So, we've got four speakers. I'm going to come up and round off at the very end. We've got four speakers. Each of them have been preparing, waiting on the Lord. They're going to do about 15 minutes each. I'd like you to give them your very, very best, just like you would if it had been somebody that, you know, you revere in some other way because they're well known around the world. Would you do that for me? Awesome. Okay. Let's hand over then to our first speaker, Jonathan Shunker. Hey guys, it's a pleasure to be here, and I thank Duncan and Kate, my awesome youth pastors, for this amazing privilege. They're absolutely amazing, amazing people. And before we start, can we just have a word of prayer? Lord Jesus, thank you that we could come here today to worship your name. Lord, we ask that you would be here with us and that your spirit would be upon us. Lord, they would open up our ears and our eyes to see you. And Lord, they would just open up our hearts to be able to receive the word that you have for us today. In your name we pray. Amen. So, you guys are in for an absolutely awesome, awesome time. I, I met with some of the speakers, and they're, you, get, you guys are just going to be blown away. But I stand up here as one of you. I stand up here as a youth. I don't stand up here as anyone perfect. I don't stand up here as anyone pretending to be perfect. I'm one of you. And the reason that I am up here is because I am one of you. And Duncan and Kate gave me the amazing privilege to be able to speak into that. And I'm just up here to compare notes with you guys. I'm just up here to tell you where I'm at. And actually what happened is that um, 
I was about 13, and that was five years ago, and I decided, sure, let's try God. I've tried the world. I've tried my way. Let's try God. And so for the past five years, I've been in deeply passionate, just going after God, just running after Him. And actually, about a month ago, I decided, what's the use? Is there a point to this? Why am I running after God? Why am I running so hard after Him that I can't seem to get any more? And do I really want this? Do I want to serve Him for the rest of my life? I've never tried living my way, and I, I can't remember what it's like to live my way. I want to try it. I want to see what it's like. So I decided to take a break from God. I decided to take a break from the church. And I just wanted to see how my life went. I want to see how it was to live for me and not to live for God. I want to see what it was like to wake up and do my own thing, to wake up and not pray, to wake up and not read the Bible, to wake up and not really care. I want to see what it would be like. And so I left. And you know what? That was one of the worst decisions I ever made. I, w I would wake up in the morning before, and I, w I would just wake up, and I'd be so excited about the day. I'd be like, ooh, what am I going to do? I'm going to go drive, or I'm going to go to work or something. And then I'd wake up and be like, I don't want to do anything. See, guys, I built my life around God. I built the past five years of my life around something central to me. And then I removed that from myself, and once I did, I didn't know who I was. Who am I? I thought that by removing myself from God, I could maybe find myself in me. I found that maybe I could find myself in the world, and maybe the world could tell me who I was. And I was really wrong. I was really mistaken. Because once, once, God, once I removed myself from God, I had no idea. I had no clue. Before, I could have told you that I was at peace with myself. I like myself. I like my life. I love God. I love my friends. I love my family. And as soon as I removed that, I had no idea who the heck I was. I didn't have love for anyone anymore. I, I hated everything. And I was so unlike me. And I came to God five years ago because I found out that I couldn't do that. I found out that I couldn't live, my, live for myself. I had to have God. And so I came to Him and I begged Him and I, and I pleaded with Him and He took me in. And then I threw it all away five years later. I threw it away. And, my mo and I was talking with my mom about this and she told me, John, five years ago, you came to God because you couldn't live without Him. What makes you think that you can live without Him now? And you know what? I had no answer. I had absolutely no answer. And then, a month after this, my grandfather died. And you know what? I had never been close to my grandfather. Never. I saw him for Christmas for the first time in about three or four years. That was the first time that I'd seen him. And I always regretted the fact that I had never gotten close to my grandfather. And even during this time that I was away from God, even during my break, I was still praying and praying for my grandfather to become a Christian. Because I know, I know that God exists. God exists. You cannot tell me otherwise. God exists, period. It's just a matter of whether I wanted him in my life or not. And so, during this time, even while I was away, I was still praying for him. I was still praying for my friends and my family. But I wouldn't pray for me. I wouldn't. I wouldn't want a relationship with God. I would just offer up prayers on behalf of other people. And when he died, it came as such a great shock because I always thought that we would have more time. I always thought there would be more time for me to get close to him and for me to, to go up to Calgary or him to come down here and for us to hang out together. But there wasn't. And when that blow came, it came as such a shock because I didn't know where he was. I didn't know if he had died and whether he was with God right now or anything like that. And I didn't know and I was just shaken. And my world was shaken and right then I wondered, what the heck had I to hold on to? What did I have? I've been trying to find myself in the world. Could the world support me? The world couldn't support me. The world can't answer questions about like where we go after death, what happens. And the world's always changing. It's not a solid rock. It's not something that I can stand on and know that I'm standing on something solid that's not going to be changing in the next 10 years. And so I removed the rock from my life, and when Paul and trouble came along, I started sinking. And so that night, my mom called us into the family room to pray. My brother and my sister and me and my dad was at work, and we just started praying. And during this time, during this month apart, I've just been trying to distance myself from God. I've just been trying to get on another planet away from Him. I've been huddling. I've been, like, trying to dive way down to the ocean. Like, you know, like, just get away from Him as far as possible. And He would not let me. 
He would not let me. He kept giving my friends words to tell me, and he would keep talking to me himself. And I remember twice going into my room, just closing the door, just yelling at him, and, God, leave me alone. I don't want this. I don't want you. And I would just yell at him and just say, no. But you know what, guys? In in my heart of hearts, deep down, I wanted him. I wanted him. I just wanted to see if I could maybe find myself. And so my mom calls us into the family room to pray. And we start praying. And I realized that God just loved me so much that even though I tried running away, even though I had gone to the depths of the seas, I tried to put myself on another planet, that, that I tried to pull up a wall between myself and him, that he still would not let me get away. That's how much he loved me. And that's how much he loved my grandfather. And that's how much he loved each and every one of you here. And when, when we went to that family room, we just started praying, and I was just sitting there, and I was just getting angrier and angrier. And I was like, God, I don't want you. And all of a sudden, I just realized all this. I'm just like, whoa, he really does love me. He really does care. Why else would he pursue me for a month? With, why, would he, why else would he hound me like that without leaving me alone if I didn't mean so much to him? Why? And I just looked up and I was like, all right, God, you know what? I can't get away from you. And if you want me this much, then you can have me. I don't know why he would, but I guess he can. So here I am. And right then, guys, right then I know how the prodigal son felt just coming home. Just coming home and just feel, just feeling Father's love just wrapped around you. And then putting the ring on your finger and putting the robe over you and calling, calling you his son again. Calling you his. Calling you his. Even though he had tried running away, even though he had spent time somewhere else, he still called you his. He still called you up. And you came back, and you, you didn't think you were going to be accepted. You kept trying to push away. No, God, I don't deserve this. No, I don't want it. And yet he would still come, still with the ring, and still with the robe, and still put it on your finger. And finally, I just broke down. I just cried. I'm like, God, I'm so sorry. God, why? Why did you hound me like that, God? Why? God, I tried running away. God, I tried, I tried leaving you. I tried going. I didn't want you. I yelled at you. I told you to leave me alone, but you, but you didn't. And you didn't. I'm, I'm telling you guys that that is one of the greatest feelings in the world to come back to him and for him to accept you and for him to put the robe on you and put the ring on you and to kiss your head and just to feel him around you. And then I just started praying and I got this vision of this like, great fire and it was just this flame and then all these coals and all all this like black stuff started going around it and started trying to like choke it and then but you know what the fire started burning through and and before long the coal was just like going off in every direction the black stuff was just going off and God told me you know what John before the foundations of the earth were laid before you were born you were born of my spirit before you were born in flesh you were born from me and you cannot run away from me because you were made in me and you returned to your beginnings. And I was just like, God, I'm so sorry. And guys, I stand up here as someone who has repented and who has been set free. But I know that there are some of you tonight who maybe just came here or maybe you were forced here, maybe it was a thing to do, I don't know. Some of you here tonight have never felt God. Some of you, some of you here may have felt it, may have turned your hearts. I don't know what your situation is. I haven't been there. However, I do know one thing, and that is that God loves you dearly, and he gave his one and only son to live for you and to die for you. He gave, God became man, so you could become God. So you could become a part of God. So you could live forever. God gave his one and only son for you. God gave the thing he treasured above all else to come down to earth, to live a life, and to become sin, so that he could not even look upon his son. That's how much God cared for each and every single one of you here. That's how much he cared for me. And I know that no matter how hard I tried, I could not, I could not stay away from his love, because his love followed me, his love hounded me. And I know that he is coming after you, some of you here. He's coming after some of you. Guys, if, if there's one thing you leave from this conference with, Leave with Him. Leave with your hearts open to Him because it is the greatest gift that you will ever receive. It is the greatest gift that you will ever be given. It's the greatest feeling in the world. 
you go out and you feel like such a conqueror because you know you are loved and you know that you have a place in his life and in his heart. And you know that without a shadow of a doubt. There's not much more I can say other than God loves you so much. God loves you. God loves you. Hello, Crutch Me in 2004! My name is Jason Schuler. I just want to give you a bit of the Word of God. If you have your Bible, open with me to Romans chapter 12, verses 1. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. And if you don't have a Bible, you can look off of someone who is a Christian who has a Bible. They're probably sitting next to you. Oh! Actually, I need to confess something. I'm reading out of my wife's Bible. But she is the most amazing woman in the world, and she's mine. Okay, we're looking at Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Do you have it? Okay, I'm going to start. Read with me here. Verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Now, let's look at verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what is the will of God, and which is good and acceptable and perfect. Amen? We're going to talk about the red mist today. You might see behind me a bit of uh, mist begin to roll off the stage. The red mist on the road of life. See, my cell leader, he was once a police officer. And uh, he, was, he was actually an amazing police officer and quite a good driver. And he learned to drive from a book called Roadcraft. Can you say that with me? Roadcraft. So I'm going to read you something from Roadcraft. I've been kind of looking through it, reading it in my spare time, trying to learn how to be a better driver. And the Spirit of God spoke to me through this book. And I feel and know for a fact that it's for us here today, in April 2004. And this is called Red Mist. Raise your hand if you know what Red Mist is. I actually don't see any hands. There's two or three over there, okay. Well, let me tell you what Red Mist is. Red Mist is the term used to describe the state of mind of drivers who are so determined to achieve some objective like catching a vehicle in front or getting to an incident as quick as possible, that they are no longer capable of realistically assessing the risks on the road. Did you catch that? Red mist is a term used to describe the state of mind of someone who is no longer capable of realistically assessing driving risks. Red mist on the road called life. Some of you here need to get a little red mist into your life. Some of you here need to be covered in your eyes by the red mist of Holy Spirit. Some of you here need to say no to looking at the opposite sex. And yes to the red mist covering your eyes. You see, this book, Roadcraft, in it it describes... The best ways to take a corner, the best ways to accelerate, the best ways to change gears, the best ways to travel on the road. And red mist is a bad thing for drivers. But in the kingdom of heaven, my friends, red mist is what we need. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2 is talking about red mist. I urge you, brothers, live your lives like a sacrifice to God. There's nothing else around you. It's just you and Him. Live your lives like a sacrifice, holy and pleasing and acceptable to God. We need a little red mist in this room. We need our eyes to be covered by the red mist of the Holy Spirit. And i got to read you a couple more things from this book because it's fascinating. It It tells me so much about the way the world tells us to live. And it gives us the inverse 
of what God wants us to live. Check this out. Their minds are not on driving. This is someone who's covered in red mist. But they're on some other goal. Do you feel that? Some other goal is on their mind. They have become emotionally and psychologically caught up in the chase. Red mist can affect all drivers, but especially those in the emergency services. <laughs> Come on. Listen up here. These are some ways that you can prevent red mist. So as I read these, I want you to know I'm saying the opposite. Because I don't want to prevent red mist over your life. I want you to invite the red mist of Holy Spirit in your life. But this is what the world's been telling you. Be dispassionate about the task. And consecrate on non-aggressive language to describe other drivers. Point two from Roadcraft. Do not imagine what you are likely to find at the destination. Rather, concentrate on your driving. Point three of Roadcraft. Concentrate on your driving. If you find this difficult, speak to yourself. Give yourself a running commentary on how the drive is going. It sounds a little funny, guys and girls, but let me tell you something. The world has been speaking this to you day in and day out. You see it in commercials. You see it in the movies. You see it in your own habits and patterns of behavior. It's all about me. It's all about what I'm doing right now. There's no consequences. There's nothing in the future that's going to hinder me or I'm going to walk into. It's just here and now that matters. And I'm telling you right now, guys, we need some red mist in our lives. Some Holy Spirit, God-ordained red mist to block our lives, block our sights, blinders to see the goal. Let me read this again, and, and you, you're going to start seeing what I mean here. Roadcraft tells us to concentrate on the road. Jesus would say, for the joy set before me, I endured the cross, knowing what lies ahead. I endured today. We need some red mist in our life. Roadcraft would tell us, be dispassionate. Concentrate on your behavior rather than personality. And the Bible is a book not about behavior, but it's about the heart. It's filled with passages about your heart. It's the wellspring of life. It's the place where God comes in and dwells. When you say, God, I need you. He doesn't come to the head. He doesn't come to the feet. He comes to the heart. I'm telling you, you need road, you need red mist in this road called life. You need some passion to arise in your heart. You need some passion to grow in that heart. Turn with me, please, to Hebrews chapter 12. It's funny, this red mist stuff, it may not help being a driver, but when you're a Christian and your eyes are so set on the kingdom of heaven, on Father's will, on the Lord Jesus Christ, it's the best way to live. My favorite scripture in the Bible is John chapter 10, verse 10. And in it, Jesus says, there's an enemy and he comes to steal, kill and destroy. But I have come that they may have life, and they may have life to the fullest. You guys are going to get life to the fullest this weekend. Abundant life. And that comes with saying, God, cover my eyes with your red mist. Cover my eyes, Holy Spirit, with your red mist. Are you there? Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we have such a great cloud surrounding us, witnesses, let us lay aside everything that encumbers us. The sin which so easily entangles us. Lay it aside. You see, roadcraft will tell you that it's about here and now. And it's important to be focused on your behavior and what you do. But the Bible doesn't end with saying, lay aside your sin. Lay aside your, your, your entanglements. But it says, Run the race which is set before you. 
Run the race which Father has said. This is for you. This is your destiny. This is your purpose. Look at verse 2. Picking up in verse 1, the end of it. Run with endurance. Endurance, the race that was before us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. For the red mist over his eyes, he looked through the suffering and he said, there is a purpose in life. There is a reason that I am here. Fresh wind 2004 is more than just another step, another breath. But it's a purpose. It's a God-ordained destiny for you to say, Holy Spirit, cover my eyes. Don't let me be distracted any longer, God. Cover my eyes with your red mist. Let me be so focused on the goal before me. The Lord Jesus Christ. The author, the finisher of my faith. That nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. So I'm going to lead you in prayer this moment, right here. Your hearts are challenged. You hear the call, the whistle of God saying, Come on, army, let's go. Come on, army, let's go. Come on, army, let's go. And I want to lead you in a prayer that says, Holy Spirit, cover me with your red mist. Surround me in the red mist of the kingdom. So I want you to stand to your feet, right here as a declaration. I want to enter in to the kingdom of heaven. I want to be a part of the destination, not just the journey. I want to be part of the goal, which is the kingdom of heaven. The prayer that Jesus told us to pray. Your kingdom come, God, here. So follow me now in this prayer. Lord Jesus, I invite you now. Cover my eyes. Cover my heart in the red mist of Holy Spirit. Fill me, God, with your red mist. Cause me to be consumed with the destination, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. And for the joy set before me, God, I will endure present suffering and I will seek you and I will call your kingdom here and I'm going to rescue others along the way. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Bless you guys. Thank you. By the way, I have a cell that meets on Wednesday nights. If you're interested, you live in the GTA. You're welcome to come to my cell. Come see me afterwards. Keep standing. My brother Andrew Gazzaneo is going to bring the word of the Lord. Stand back up. Stand back up. Stand back up. Cool. Okay, can I get you guys... I just want to pray some stuff over you that's been on my heart. So I'm going to talk about purity. It's always a popular topic amongst our generation. So can I get you guys to raise your hands above your head and close your eyes? I just want to pray some stuff over you. Yeah. Holy Spirit, we just declare that we seek your agenda, this conference and today. There is no other Lord but Jesus in this place. Yeah, and I just declare that Jesus is Lord over every life, over all your destinies, over all your minds, over all your bodies in the name of Jesus. I just, I just take authority in the name of Jesus just against anything that would try and bring discouragement against you, that would try and bring confusion. I rise up against you. And in me, greater is he that, in me that is, than he that is in the world. And we just say that I am more than a conqueror in the name of Jesus Christ. And I tear down all of your works, enemy, and every person's heart and every person's spirit. And I just speak light into every dark place in people's hearts and people's lives right now in the name of Jesus. Let every dark thing be exposed in the name of Jesus. We call you out. Satan, we call it all your works enemy, and we say that none of your works will come to any fruition. We declare every work of the enemy is null and void in the name of Jesus. And I just declare the kingdom and the authority of God in this place over all of your lives right now in the name of Jesus. I declare that Jesus is Lord, that his power is more than enough to rule your life and to rule our generation in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah. Okay, you guys can sit down. So purity, yeah.
purity is one of those keys to like the Christian life. If I could really get all the guys to put their eyes on me, I'd appreciate that. Ladies, this is for you as well, but I really want to speak to the guys right now. Purity is one of those keys for our generation, especially for us as guys. I'd say the number one way that, that the enemy likes to trip up our generation, especially us guys, is impurity. We miss it. We get confused or we get condemned or we fall. Anyone know what I'm talking about? Yeah? No? Yeah? Yeah. You guys can, you guys can talk back to me. There we go. There we go. Um, so really, like, in, in the Christian life, purity sometimes seems like a battle, which is totally not supposed to be the case and it's not biblical at all. But in a lot of ways, especially in my life, it seemed like it's a battle. Like I've got to work to be pure. I've got to do the right stuff. I've got to get the right thing. So like, it's almost like the Christian definition of purity is like, do the right stuff. Do the right thing. Get to the right place. Right? You know what I'm talking about? You know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna look at porn this week, man, cause I, I just wanna be pure for God, or, um, I'm, I'm really gonna do my best to obey my parents, or I'm gonna honor my leaders, or I'm, X, Y, Z. I'm gonna try and do it so that the end result equals purity. Um, the truth is, that is not at all biblical. The only way we can be pure, the only way we can be holy biblically, is through Jesus. Does that make sense? Now let me explain it. If you got your Bible, flip to Galatians 2.11. Got it in the message version, which is what I'm going to be reading. Let me just preface this a little bit. Paul's telling a, a quick story here. Um, him and his buddy Peter got into a little bit of a tiff, and basically Paul Paul was saying to Pete, "Dude, you're acting like fake. You're acting like a fake Christian. What's the deal with that?" He just basically called them on it. You know, like me, some of the guys in my cell, they're in, in, in with me. There's times where they they come to me and they're like, "Drew, uh, what's the deal with that? Why are you acting like this? Or why are you acting like that?" And so it's just kind of like that. That's, a, that's what Paul is doing to Peter here. So I'm going to start verse 11. Later, Peter came to Antioch, and I had a face-to-face confrontation with him because he was clearly out of line. Here's the situation. Earlier, before certain persons had come from James, Peter regularly ate with the non-Jews. But when that conservative group came from Jerusalem, he cautiously pulled back and put as much distance as he could manage between himself and his non-Jewish friends. That's how fearful he was of the conservative Jewish clique. That's been pushing the old system of circumcision. Unfortunately, the rest of the Jews in the Antioch church joined in that hypocrisy, so that even Barnabas was swept along in the Sarad. So, so the story basically is, um, Peter's acting like all religious. It's all cool for him to hang out with non-Jews um, when like the religious people aren't around, but then those religious people come around and he's like, oh, I've got to act a certain way so that people think I'm holy or they think that I'm right. Um, and that kind of translates to the way we act today in the church, right? I, I got I got to act a certain way, and I got to look the right. I got to look the Christian part, so that you know that girl who's really holy over there will think that you know I'm marriageable, or I'm like a marriage material. Does that make sense? Or like I really want to impress the youth pastor, so I better be praying tongues really loud so that he hears me on Sunday, and then maybe he'll ask me to lead worship Sunday. Or, you know what I mean? We're really concerned with what other people think of us, and the truth is, in the kingdom, that's total garbage. Um, let me keep going. Verse 14. But when I saw that they were not maintaining a steady, straight course according to the message, I spoke up to Peter in front of them all. So Paul's like, dude, I I need to talk about this. If you, a Jew, live like a non-Jew when you're not being observed by the watchdogs from Jerusalem, what right do you have to require non-Jews to conform to Jewish customs just to make a favorable impression on your old Jerusalem cronies? It's kind of funny. Um, So he's like, dude... We know Jews have, sorry, we know Jews have no advantage of birth over non-Jewish sinners. We know very well that we are not set right with God by rule keeping, but only through personal faith in Jesus Christ. Now that's the key. I'm gonna keep going for a second. How do we know? We've tried it. So the Jews really did try this. You guys don't know much about Judaism. They have like billions of rules. Rules for everything. What you can eat, what you can wear, how you can sleep, when you can sleep, who, like, ev- like everything. Anything you can think of, there's like a rule about it. And they've tried all those rules. And it's really easy. The more rules you have, the more rules you break, right? Basically, does that make sense? I don't understand that. I went to like a, a semi-private high school, and they had like rules for everything. And so you you were bound to break a rule because there was a rule for everything. You were always bound. You were always breaking rules. It's kind of like that. And Paul's like, we've tried that. We tried that, like having tons of rules. We had the best system of rules the world has ever seen. But convinced that no human being can please God by self-improvement, we believe in Jesus as the Messiah. 
so that we might be set right before God by trusting in the Messiah, not by trying to be good. I love that. Paul's like, we can't please God. We can't get holy. We can't get pure by self-improvement. I can't read my Bible enough so that God thinks I'm pure. I can't pray in tongues enough. I can't heal enough people. I can't do the right stuff equals purity. It's not the way the kingdom works. Guys, especially, please listen to me. That's not the way the kingdom of God works. You don't get pure by what you do. Let's keep going. Verse 17. Have some of you noticed that we are not yet perfect? Guys, here's the truth. I, Andrew Gazzaneo, am not yet perfect. Sorry, ladies. No great surprise, right? And are you ready to make that accusation that since people like me who go through Christ in order to get things right with God aren't perfectly virtuous, Christ must therefore be an accessory to sin. So he's like, dude, just don't worry about that. Christ is totally holy. If I was trying to be good, I would be rebuilding the same old barn that I tore down. I'd be acting like a charlatan. So he's like, actually, I'm going to keep going. Sorry, this is so good. Um, Starting in verse 19. What actually took place is this. This is the deal. Paul's like, okay, guys, I tried keeping rules and working my head off to please God, and it didn't work. So I quit being a law man so that I could be God man. Christ showed me how and enabled me to do it. I identified myself completely, completely with him. Indeed, I have been crucified with Christ. My ego is not central anymore. It's no longer important that I appear righteous before you or have your good opinion. I'm no longer driven to impress God. Christ lives in me. The life you see me living is not mine, but it's lived by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I'm not going to go back on that. Mm. So the truth is, Paul just said it there, real holiness isn't record keeping. It isn't, it isn't like seeing how close you can get to the line. And this is really important. I think a lot of times as Christians, you meet with Jesus and you try and live the Christian life. Um, but it's like, it's like this is sin right, okay, right here. If I step off the edge, I'll be in sin. So a lot of times as Christians, we're like, oh, there's that line. Dang, there's that line. Okay, it's right there. Oh, my gosh, it's right there as well. Okay, I just got to, um, man, where do I go? Oh, crap. There's this line, it seems like everywhere. And sometimes we act like that as Christians, right? Like, how close can I get to the line? Or, or you know, like, you'll, you'll be like, oh, there's that line sin. You know, I just, uh, well, I'm not really going over. You know, I'm, I'm close, though. <laughs> and we do that. You know what I mean? We totally do that as Christians. Sometimes we see how close we can get to the line without going over, just so we kind of, like, almost get to the line. Which is, which is totally not the way we're meant to live. The way we're meant to live as Christians, it's not even think about the line. The line is no longer an issue. Right? When we're Christians, we turn around and we're like, God, you are incredible. Jesus, I love you so much. I just wanna, I wanna get closer to you. I wanna know you more. What can I do to get clo- How can I, how can I know you more? Tell me more about you. So like, when you're doing that, when you're walking that real Christian life, this isn't even, this is like not even in, in your sights. Does that make sense? The real passionate life, the life that Jay was talking about, the thing that Chunker was talking about, you know, hardcore Christianity has nothing to do with this. It has to do with turning around and recognizing how incredible our God is and running into that. So real purity has nothing to do with what you do other than falling in love with God. Is that good? Does that make sense? Yes? Shout amen for me. All right, all right, all right. Um, so I'm not like an expert on love. But I, I'm going to talk to you for a second about that. When you're in love with someone, um, it isn't so much like, what can I do to not hurt this person's feelings? Or how can I, you know, have this girl not hate me? That's not, that's, not, that's not what I do when I'm in love with someone. When I'm in love with someone, I'm like, what can I do to impress her? How can I, how can I love her? What can I do that will make her feel like a million bucks? How can I show her that I want, I want her to have all my attention? Right? Ladies, you deserve someone like that. You deserve someone who wants to give you their full attention, their full heart. You do. And there's this lie over our generation that I'm just going to call out right now. There's this lie over our generation that says, ladies, you've got to put it out there before you're going to get something. That's, that's, that's total garbage. That's total garbage. If he's a man of God, he will see your heart first. Actually, sorry, let me back that up. If he's a man of God, he will see your spirit first. He will see God in you first. Then he'll see your heart, and then he'll see the outside. And guys, that's the truth. I'm not trying to talk down on the guys, because we have some amazing guys in this place. But the truth is, guys, what's on the outside does not matter. It totally doesn't. It totally does not. What's inside is what really counts. Anyways, so 
When you're in love with someone, you're all about what can I do to impress them? What can I do to love them? What can I do to make them feel like a million bucks? And it's kind of like that when you're in a relationship with the Lord. It isn't about like, oh, yeah, he told me not to do that, so man, I made that mistake again. Crap, I keep doing that. I'm, ugh. You know, it's not about that. It's about what can I do today to make you feel happy, God? What can I do to love you today? How can I show you how important you are to me today? That's what the Christian walk's about. My, one of the guys on my cell, Alpesh, is he here? Is Alpesh here? No, he's not. He's at, he's at work. He's going to come tonight. Amazing man of God. And he said this once at cell, and it just like smacked me in the face. He said, purity, okay, it's a position, but it's also a progression. So because of what Jesus did, bam, immediately everybody in this place is pure. The second you say, Jesus, you're my Savior. But it's also a progression, because the closer and deeper and further you get into God, the, the further away you are from that line. Getting further, getting further, getting further, getting further, getting further, getting further. That's, what, that, that's the reality of purity. But you're not working at getting away from this. You're working at falling in love, which is like the best. We're meant to fall in love. Anybody ever been in love? Anyone? <laughs> when it's right, baby, it's right. Um, I'm not going to talk you guys, talk your ears off anymore. That verse, Galatians 2, 20 and 21, if you could put up that last slide. I totally recommend that you guys memorize this scripture. Because there's so much truth in this. And there's going to be times where the enemy's going to be breathing down your neck saying, oh, you messed up again, or you, you're not acting right, or you're not, you're not doing the right stuff, dude. But you can say, the truth is, I've been crucified with Christ. Actually, why don't you guys say this with me, okay? I've been crucified with Christ. Okay, you guys are, come on. <laughs> Let's try it again. Ready? I've been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Thanks, guys. Wow. Ladies, he's still single. God is love. God is love, and he loves you. What does that mean? My name is Linda, by the way. And uh, can I say hi? What does that mean? What does it mean when God loves you? How many of us have heard your youth leader say, God loves you, man. You know, he's love and he loves you. How many of us have ever heard that? Every hand should probably go up. If you haven't heard it, I'm telling you now. God is love, and he loves you. I think one of the last questions that uh, um, Andrew asked was, how many of you guys have ever been in love? Now, I don't know if you know this, and I've not yet had the privilege of falling in love, but I've come, I'm, I'm sure I've come close in some ways. But when you love someone, when you're in love with someone, you can't help but love the thing and the things that they love. Right? For instance, I, I, I actually um, really like this, this guy in high school. And um, I've always been a, a Christian music slash Christian rock, like Audio Adrenaline, Jars of Clay, DC Talk type fan. Right? So, so you guys know what I'm talking about. Now, this guy in high school liked hip-hop and punk and uh, some reggae and, and music that was foreign language to me. I had no clue. But he was so into it. Like, Eminem was like his hero. And I'm like thinking, Eminem, you mean, you mean snack? You mean, <laughs> what? But I liked him so much, I started liking the things he liked. He'd be like, hey, Linda, let, you know, listen to this, listen to this. And I'd listen, oh, wow, yeah, that's cool. And I'll start trying to find things about it that I liked. And I'd be like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's kind of cool. I like that, yeah. I can see myself listening to this. And, uh, I mean, it didn't stick. I'm still, uh, <laughs> I'm still, I'm still a, a rock fan, but, um, but that just shows. But the great thing is, the point of this is, God doesn't just love you. He is in love with you. He is in love with you. What does that mean? He loves the things that you love. The pure things that you love. 
He loves your smile. He loves your heart. He loves your sense of humor. He loves your fascination with the latest Viper or Lamborghini or my friend, uh, the BMW Z4, and in my case, the Mini Cooper S. <laughs> he loves that about you. He loves the fact that you love skiing, not snowboarding, or you love snowboarding, not skiing. He loves the fact that, you know, you love the night stars. You love taking a walk in the summer breeze. He, he loves your taste in music. He loves your sense of humor. He laughs at all your jokes. That's how much he loves you. He loves your dreams, even the wacky ones. I remember when I went to um, I went to England as a uh, um, on an outreach with I went uh, graduated from school ministry, but on this school I went to Bath um, and I was doing a talk on dreams and 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 God wants to fulfill your dreams and and this one guy I was like, what is your dreams? And one guy said, you know, it, it sounds like there's no limitations in the world. You know, what would you want to be or what, what would you want to do? And one guy goes, I want to be like Spider-Man. <laughs> and I'm like thinking in my head, oh my gosh, how am I supposed to turn this around? And I'm like, well, you know what? You never know. So I can use your ideas to create a new form of transportation. <laughs> but it's so true. God loves you, even the things that people will laugh about. He loves what you love. He loves the things that you love. And you know what? The, the crazy thing, though, is John, um, Jason talked about this. He said, John 10.10 10 says, The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I come that they may have life, that you may have life, and life abundantly, and life to the fullest. The thing is, Satan comes to steal and kill and destroy from you. And I know that you could all think of an example, or several for that matter. He wants to take away your joy. He wants to take away your peace. He wants to take away your passion. He wants to take away, he wants to take your eyes away from God who is there and keep your eyes and steal you of your freedom by keeping your eyes on the, the line right here. He wants to keep your eyes and he wants to steal your focus and cause it to be, you know, you know focused on your limitations. He, he points out your insecurities. He wants to bring death to your passions. He wants to bring, he wants to destroy your dreams and your, your hope. He wants to destroy and steal your purity. He's done that to me. He's stolen my right to be a daughter. You know, my father was so physically, verbally, and um, mentally abusive that me and my sisters, along with my mom, had to run away. It's been 18 years since I've seen him last. Satan has stolen my right to hear as a daughter, Linda, you are beautiful. And you are the most beautiful woman in the entire world, and I love you. You are daddy's princess. But I've got good news for you. The verse doesn't end. The thief came to steal, kill, and destroy. The verse ends, but God, Jesus, he came to give life, and life to the fullest, life where death has been brought into, life where you've been stolen, life where love has, has been taken from you. God's love for you is to give back to you. Just like Andrew was saying, when he, when he likes someone, he wants to make them feel like a million bucks. Did you hear that girl, by the way? Are you single? <laughs> he wants to make you feel like a million bucks. He wants to give everything, you know, what does she like? She doesn't like roses, she likes daisies. I'm getting her daisies. You know, oh, um, she's not into chocolate, but she loves fuzzy peaches. I'm going to get her whole bag of fuzzy peaches. Right? What about girls? How many of you guys have ever liked someone? And you can, it's all you could do to keep yourself from writing them a note. And then you write them a note like four or five times, and you like throw each of them away. And then you're just like, oh. And then you try to word it so you don't sound too desperate, or you don't really like them, and then, uh. God knows what you love. He knows you so intimately. 
He knows the things that you love, the little things. I'm not talking about, about a God that's way off in the distance. I'm talking about a God that's right here. Remember, he laughs at your jokes. And sometimes you mutter them under your breath. You have to be really close to hear them. Right? He wants to give you your dreams back. He wants to give you your relationships back. Everything that the enemy is doing, he wants to give back and give you even more. God has given me back my right to have a father. He has completely been my dad. My history, my family, my life before I let him be my father was riddled with pain, rejection, abandonment, shame, anger, hate, addictions, abuse, fear, hurt, 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 broken heart, broken family, broken relationships, broken this, broken that, shattered, completely shattered. I was a mess. Thank God the story never, never ends there. Thank God the story never ends at this line. He's healed me of my hurts. He has taken away my abandonment. He has taken away my rejection. He is speaking life into me. He told me, Linda, you are beautiful and you are amazing. You are smart. And I like your sense of humor, even though no one else does. Or even if no one else did, I love it. And that's me talking. He loves me. He loves everything about me. He loves that I just embarrassed myself right there. I can just hear him saying, Linda, you're awesome. You're amazing. He loves me. And not only that, not only has he been a father and a dad to me in my heart and in who I am, he's given me spiritual fathers. Don't you come up here for a second. He's even given me a spiritual daddy. I can do this. <laughs> Anytime I want. Anytime I want. And I have been told that I was beautiful. Oh, yeah. More times in the past two years than in the 20 before. God wants to restore everything that the enemy has stolen from you because he loves you. He's in love with you. But the thing is, it's your choice. It's your choice if you'll let yourself be loved by him. John Chunker was, Chunker was talking about how he was like, God was chasing after him, but he was like, step aside. I don't want you. And his life is in shambles. My life was in shambles because the entire time I thought, I don't need a dad. I don't want a dad. I don't need you. Yada, yada, yada. It's our choice if we're going to let him love us. And if we're going to let his love affect us, and if we're going to let his love, his abundant love, and his abundant life, the gift that he wants to give us, it's our choice if we want to take it. It says in the Bible, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. And I was thinking about that verse, and I was like, God, there's no way I can love you with all my heart, all my mind all my soul, and all my strength, unless I give you all of me. Because there's no way I could do it. I don't have that much love in me. You know, I could love my Mini Cooper too much. You know, I'm like, God, I have to, I have to give you all of me in order for me to love you that much. But how many of you guys are willing to trade in all of you, all of your broken pieces, all of your hurts, all of your anger, all of your frustration, all of your shame, you and everything that the enemy has stolen from you, how many of you guys want to trade that in for his life and his love and his abundant life and fall right back in love with him? And for those, you know, there's some of you, and I, in order to do that, I really want to challenge you guys this weekend to take in everything Everything that God has for you. 
for once in your life, I want you to challenge yourself and say, hey, maybe worship isn't just about jumping up and down. Maybe God is saying something. Maybe it's a love letter to me. Hey, maybe we're like whoever's speaking up here. Maybe God is actually saying how much he loves me. Hey, maybe I should listen. And I want you to give yourself a chance to fall right back in love with him. And when we do that, I'm going to go back to the first point. When you fall in love with someone, you can't help but love the things that they love. And after loving you guys, first and foremost, after loving you, first and foremost, in his heart, he sees your face. He loves your friends. He loves those around you who are hurting and dying, just like I was, just like you were. He not only wants to give you that hope, but he wants, he wants you to spread it to all those around you. But it also says, it says in, it says in um, the Bible, after it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, it says, love your neighbor as yourself. But there's no way we can love our neighbor unless we love ourselves. And unless we let his love fall down on us, we don't know what love means. So I challenge you guys this weekend, God, give me all you've got. Give me all you've got. I challenge you, God, and I want to fall in love with you. And in turn, I want to love the things that you love. I want to be like, whoa, God, that's amazing. I never saw that aspect of you. I never thought, whoa, you love that too. You love my friend Jeff too. You love Cindy as well. Whoa. You care about them as much as I do. So I just want to bless you guys. You're amazing. You're in for an awesome treat. Let him fall in love. Let him, let him fall in love with you and fall right back in love with him. You're awesome. <laughs> Let's stand up, everybody. Okay, I want you to stay focused, okay? Just stay focused right now. All right. I believe that everybody in this room this afternoon falls into those four categories. There are people that are in this room that have been walking with Jesus some of you for many years, some of you for just a few months. But like Jonathan Shunker at the beginning, for one reason or another, maybe you've consciously or subconsciously decided that you're no longer going to pursue Jesus the way you have been. And let me tell you, it is just the kindness of your Heavenly Daddy towards you that your best friend loved you enough to grab a hold of you and persuade you to come. And some of you are here today by the skin of your teeth, as we say in England. You're here holding on by your fingernails. I want to say to you today, you're so welcome. You're exactly where God wants you to be, right here. And in a few moments, you're going to have an incredible meeting with the God that you turned your back on. The God who, for one reason or another, you thought didn't care about you who you thought didn't have a plan and a purpose for your life. And you're going you're gonna to discover, just like Jonathan did, that in actual fact, God has been pursuing you. But where you were weak and where you felt that you couldn't keep pursuing Him, you're going to discover that in actual fact, He's strong and He loves you and His love is stronger than yours and it's irresistible and He's been loving you. He's been breathing down your neck. But with the hot breath of the Holy Spirit. And this afternoon, we want to give you an opportunity to come running back into your Heavenly Daddy's arms. There are some of you that are here that have never before asked Jesus Christ into your heart to be your number one champion. 
to be the champion of your life. Not to be an abstract champion to one side that you hero worship forever. No, no. I'm talking about a champion that loves you enough to champion in you, for you, with you, your life, so that it, you're a success in the kingdom of heaven. Doom. Christianity is not for wimps. Christianity is for brave hearts. Christianity is for samurai warriors in the spirit. Christianity is the greatest calling for any human being. The greatest fulfillment that you could ever have. And if you're here today and you've never asked Jesus into your life, don't think for a moment that Christianity is a crutch for you, that you can use to help you out. And don't you dare, don't you dare arrogantly think that the people that are around you have asked Jesus into their hearts because they had so many problems that nothing else could solve for them. No, no, no. The people that are around you have invited Jesus Christ into their hearts because they are bold-hearted, passionate, radical men and women who want to make a difference in this messed up world. So I want to give you a bold invitation this afternoon to get with the program of the Kingdom of Heaven. I want you to know that yes, your Heavenly Daddy passionately loves you. But I want you to know that your sin and my sin, all the filth, all the stuff that's in us that's screwed up and messed up, and the things that we screw up and mess up others with, our selfishness and our pride, those things have been assigned. It has already been assigned that those things will spend an eternity in the fire, judgment fire, of what they call hell. And you and I have the limited amount of time that we have on this earth compared to all eternity of however many years God's given us. We have this one opportunity to become eternally separated from our sin. Otherwise, our sin's destiny becomes our destiny. God never made you for hell. He made hell for your sin. But if you insist on rejecting Him for the rest of your life, pushing Him away, stubbornly going on in your own way, which is the most cowardly thing a human being could do, is fulfill your own selfish, our own selfish ambitions. You see, when we suck inwards and we think that this world is all about me, we live out of a cowardly life. But when we realize that this life is all about receiving God's phenomenal love and giving that love away to everybody that we meet, we have the greatest challenges in front of us and we become incredibly brave-hearted. Don't be angry with God and make out that He's not a God of love when with tears in His eyes He turns around and says to you, You're assigned, your sin has been assigned to eternal destruction and you died complete with your sin. Therefore you must go to that same place. You see, because I can't think of anything worse than discovering that God didn't do that and in actual fact, He let all of my sin come with me into heaven because I know that my sin would seriously screw up that place. And so would yours. And somebody said to me once, what kind of a God of love would make, make it so that the majority ends up going to hell when the, major, when, when the minority, only the minority, receive Jesus Christ the one way and go to heaven? And I said to him, sir, you've, you're misled in your thinking. You see, in actual fact, a more poignant statement is this. What kind of a despotic, horrendous God would force you and me, who did not want Him for 50 or 60 years, to have to spend eternity with Him? So this afternoon, you have a choice and an opportunity to be like Shankar 
to be like Jonathan Shunker and each of and, and Andrew and Jason and Linda and me and all of the other countless people that are around you who have given their lives to Jesus Christ. And if you're here for the first time and you've got all those questions, you know, there's so many different gods. Surely it can't just be one. But let me tell you, absolutely it's one. Absolutely. And it must be, because there is only one creator of everything, and he demands our worship. He doesn't just demand it, but actually he's worthy of it. He's totally worthy of it. And i got some news for you. There is no other God in all of heaven and in all of earth. You see, everything that is within, there's either a creator and then everything created, or it's just a load of rubbish. But the world around you tells you there's a creator. Scientists know there's a creator. And that creator, he passionately loves you. Made you to look like him, walk like him, think like him, look like him. Love like him. If you want to invite Jesus into your heart right now where you're sitting. Right now. I want you to put your hand up like this. If you want to receive Jesus for the first time. Come on, don't be shy. Put it up in a bold-hearted way that says from now on, I'm a born-again Christian. I want to be a born-again Christian. I don't care what it costs me. I want to be one of those brave hearts. Come on, I see a load of hands. I want to see a whole lot more hands. That's good. That's good. I like that bold hand raise over there. Well done. I like it. Yours too. Good. Anybody else? Come on. We've only got this few moments. Put your hands right up. Thank you, girls. Thank you. Well done. Good. Good. Very good. Excellent. Hold them up very bravely like this. Don't be telling me that your hands got tired. Because your Savior held out his hands like this for six hours. Crucified on a cross for you. Now, if you're holding up your hand, I want you to run out to the front right here in front of us. Just come and run out here. Come on, run. Just come out quickly. Come on, let's give them... Good, 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 good. Come on, the door's open. The door's open. Come on. I know there's more. There's more. There's more. There's more. There's more. Come on. Good. 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 There's much. There's much, much more. Right in the back. I saw some hands right in the back. Come on. Come on. Don't be ashamed. Come on. This is the most brave hearted thing that you're ever going to do. Come on. Come on, that's good. Now, okay, all of you, turn to your friend and say, do you need to get out there? Come on. Okay, listen up. One of the greatest things that holds people outside of the kingdom of heaven, the Holy Spirit is just speaking to me right now, and He's saying to me, Duncan, it's not drugs. It's not sex. not money. You know what it is? It's embarrassment. And I can't believe how pathetic that is. I can't believe that the devil is able to sow those pathetic lies into our hearts to make us lose our eternal destination of heaven because we're embarrassed. And I believe that God's raising up an incredible generation with the Generation X. And an incredible generation with the Echo Generation. 
And the millennium generation will build even stronger because they're going to be a people, okay, that say, no, I'm not embarrassed. I am not embarrassed by my Savior Jesus. I'm not ashamed of Him. I'm not ashamed of Him. I don't want to be ashamed of Him. Yeah! Let me tell you something. I don't care whether you don't have the latest video game. I don't care whether you don't know what the latest hit song is on the charts. I don't care whether you're wearing the wrong clothes because styles have moved on and you didn't realize it. I don't care whether you drive a BMW or an Audi Quattro or whatever else there is. I could, quite honestly, I used to care about those. I don't care about them anymore. Because I'm sick and tired of watching four billion people on the face of the planet, well, three billion people on the face of the planet going like this towards hell because they've been sold a lie that riches, materialism, will give them greater joy. I'm sick of it! God never created you for money. He created money for you. God loves you so much, guys, that are up here, all of you that are in this room. God loves you so much, He made everything in this world for you, personally. He personally made it for you. That's incredible, isn't it? Now listen to me. If you have walked with Jesus in the past, but you have not been walking with Him, then let me tell you something. The grace that saved you must be the grace that sanctifies you. It must be the grace that you continually receive in order to make it. You got on a plane, or you got in a car, or you got on the train to get here. And if at any point you decided, I don't want that journey anymore, and you turned around and jumped out of that car, or you took a parachute out of the aeroplane, or you jumped off the train, you would not be here right now. And there's a lot of people that are in this in this world that are Christians, and they don't realize it, but they jumped off the train. And guys, there's people in this room right now and it's not because God is not full of grace because His grace is there for you right away. But let me tell you something. If you jump off that road and you decide to head in the other direction, what counts is which direction are you walking in? And if you turn around and you're walking in another direction, let me tell you something right now, friend. I have, I am here this afternoon. The four of us were here this afternoon to say to you, for heaven's sakes, for your sake, get back on that track. Turn around and come running back to your daddy. If that's you, then come out quickly. If you know that you have not been walking with Jesus, and you once did, but you know deep down inside that you're not walking with him anymore, then I want you to come out quickly. Nathaniel, could you come up and jump on those keyboards? If you have been walking with Jesus, but you are not walking with him today, because you've been walking another direction, then I open up this platform, this area to you right now. You need to come out quickly. You need to come quickly. You need to come quickly. We love you. I love you, young man. You've got a beautiful spirit. I can see that. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. We welcome you. We welcome you. We, we welcome home. <laughs> welcome, welcome home. Look at them all. Come on. Come back, come back, come back in the very beginning. Don't wait till Saturday. Come, come now. Come back home. Come back to your daddy. Come back home. Come back home. Oh, you, you, you're so welcome, all of you. You are so welcome home. I wish I could just give you all a massive hug. Say so welcome back. In fact, I'm going to do just that.
Welcome home, son. Now look. Welcome home, man. This is good. This is good. This is great. Be a phenomenal man of God. Okay? What Andrew was saying about it's not the outside that counts. A lot of people have been looking at you and they've been judging you for what you would like to look like. And God says, man, they got it all wrong. It doesn't matter what you look like. They look good to me. They look handsome. Your heavenly daddy says, you look like me. You got your dad's good looks. Huh? Welcome to the kingdom of heaven. It's a kingdom of love. And you don't need to be scared. Why in the world would you be scared? I don't know. <laughs> I heard her whisper, oh my gosh, I'm scared. <laughs> oh, that was you, was it? You don't need to be scared. God loves you passionately. Welcome home. You see, if every one of us in this room had the horrendous embarrassment of the movie of our lives being shown right up there on that screen, everything that we've done in our lives, every one of us would put our hands on our ears, cover our eyes, and bury our heads, and say, Yeah! Don't show them that bit! No, not that bit! And you know what? I call that the great qualifier. I call that the great equalizer. Every one of us has screwed ourselves up one way and another. Every one of us has made mistakes, haven't we? Every one of us has done things that we feel ashamed about. Every one of us would love to turn things back and make things right again. Well, guess what? That's what becoming a born-again Christian is all about. It's about God giving you a brand new start. You becoming a brand spanking new person. A brand new person. And you get to be born all over again. And get to start again. And yeah, you'll make mistakes, but this time, instead of those mistakes being held against you, the blood. Yeah, that's right, blood. How many of you know you don't get to have blood flowing out of you unless you got a big owie? And Jesus Christ had a lot of big owies. Many of you have seen the brutal film. Well, let me tell you something. That film's only two hours long. Jesus suffered like that for 12 hours. So his blood right now is cleaning you all up, every one of you. And just like Andrew said, you're going to be made pure. And I don't care whether you've got a stud through your tongue a stud through your tummy button, a stud through your top of your ear, or stud through your nostril. I don't really care. And God loves it and loves you. It's only prejudiced humans that get all uptight about that sort of thing. But one thing's for sure, on the inside, you're going to be totally transformed. So I want you to hold your hands out like this right now. Those of you up here at the front. Those of you standing, please. Thank you for being patient. I don't know about you, but I think it's worth waiting, don't you? I think it's worth it. You just close your eyes, sweetie. Keep your eyes closed. Each one of you, I just want you just to close your eyes so you can focus not to be religious but just so you can really focus in this moment the Spirit of God is going to come to you you're going to feel His presence for the first time in your lives what does He feel like? well He feels like pure peace he feels like pure love contentment that sense of ah, it's okay 
I'm home. Now this is just the beginning and you've got a lot of challenges ahead of you. But let's start right now. With your hands open and your heart open, say this with me. Speak it out loud boldly because I don't want you to be a weed. I want you to be a bold, strong, mighty man, a mighty woman of God. I don't want you to be a pathetic wimp that's so ashamed that you, you can't even speak out the name of Jesus. So right now, let's make a decision that we're going to be bold. And let's go for it. So pray this with me, okay? I'm going to say a few words. You're going to say them after me. Make them your own, okay? God in heaven, Heavenly Daddy, I come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. I recognize today that I've been living my life out of selfishness, out of self-motivation and self-orientation. In other words, I've been doing my own thing. And in doing that, I've hurt you and I've hurt others and I've hurt myself. I'm so sorry. And I turn away from that life. I turn away from the world. I turn away from the devil. I turn away from living for myself. And I turn to you. Jesus Christ, I believe that you're the Son of God. That you're God. Today you're my God. And I open up my heart to you. Come into my life. Make me brand new. Brand new. On the inside. Brand new start. Born all over again. Come and wash me. With that blood that you shed. Wash me clean. From all the guilt. From all the shame, take it away from me, Lord. And I set my heart and I set my mind on following hard after you. I'm going to pursue you all the days of my life. And I ask that you would fill me right now with your Spirit, with the Holy Spirit, so that I can pursue you with your strength and your power working in me. And I ask that you'll use me to transform my generation. In Jesus' name, Amen. Let's give them a big hand. Okay, I want you to follow that, uh, that arrow right there. See it pointing in that direction? That arrow pointing in that direction? I want you to follow those arrows, all of you that have given your life to Jesus, or those of you that have recommitted your lives, all of you that are up front here, okay? Follow them through. Your friends are with you. They're going to take you through the next steps that you're going to make on your journey with God. Come on, let's give them a big cheer. Yeah! Now we got some time and there's another category of people that are here. I really feel that Jason's word about the red mist is a very significant word to many of you. You know that you're born again. You know that you have your quiet times. You know that you're walking with Jesus and 
you're doing all the right things. To be honest with you, I don't think anybody else would would really notice that you are anything other than a really good Christian. But deep down inside of you, you know that you do not have that red mist. You don't have that kind of killer passion that says, I don't care what the cost is. I don't care what it costs me to follow Jesus. I want to be filled with a pure hatred for sin and a pure love for Jesus. Not just for a fleeting moment, but for the rest of my life. Some of you, some of you, God, is saying, I want to supernaturally give you the red mist. Because the dreams, the plans, the purposes of God for your life cannot be accomplished with a couch potato attitude. And God is calling each one of you to greatness. God is calling you to do incredible things in this world, in this time, today. And God's been speaking to many of you and He's been, He's been asking you to trust Him. You're going to do things. You're going to... Some of you, God's been speaking to you about starting churches. And the churches that God's been putting on your heart to start, they're not about bricks and mortar and shingles on roofs. They're not about chairs. They're not about worship sets and bands and things. God's been speaking to you about having churches in the best coffee stores in the city. I believe there's people here that have had visions of having a place similar to chapters where they sell the best coffee and everybody gets to look at all those books. Some of you have been stirred up in your spirit that God wants you to sell the best coffee in the city but at the back He wants you to have the most radical church that you could ever imagine. With the best dance bands and the best reggae bands, the best hip-hop bands, the best the best hangout, just the most relaxing place. Magazines and stuff that you can look at and chill out and all kinds of really cool stuff. But those are the only, those are the things that that I can see in my spirit. But I believe that there's some incredible dreams in your hearts that God's giving you right now. About how He wants church to look when you plant those churches. I'm talking to 15, 16, 17 year olds. I'm talking about people that the world would look at, the church would even look at and say, who the heck are you to plant a church? But God, by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit himself is looking at you and he's saying, you're just the man, you're just the woman that I'm looking for. And God's going to use you to plant some revolutionary churches, some revolutionary ministries, some things that people like me have never even dreamed of. But in order to succeed, you're going to need that red mist. You're going to need that, yeah! That passion! That they warn you about. Never drive when you feel like that. Never drive when you have that single-minded pursuit of the goal. Yeah. God wants to give you that very single-minded pursuit of the goal. And if that's you, I want you to come running out here. If you want that red mist that Jason was talking about, I'm going to ask him to come up because he's got it in his heart. And I'm going to ask him to just release that red mist into you. That red mist that says, God... I want to do great things for you. Because I know that you're big. You're big. Your plans for me are big. 
And unless you fill me, I'm not going to be able to do it. Unless you give me that red mist, God, I'm not going to make it. You're like those disciples that Jesus said, your, your spirit's willing, but your flesh is weak. How many of you feel like that? That's how I feel. That my, my spirit is so willing, I want to do great and bold things for God, but my flesh is weak. Well, that red mist of the Holy Spirit that Jason was talking about, that's exactly what we need so that we can make it and reach that phenomenal goal. And I'm going to hand over to him to impart that into your life. I just want you to get this picture as I pray over you. I'm a big lover of dirt bikes. And someone once told me, where your eyes go is where you're headed. And I tested it, and I've hit a couple trees. I have a few scars. <laughs> but seriously, when you keep your eyes on the goal, which is around that berm, or you keep your eyes on the goal, which is that jump, or you keep your eyes, which are the gate of your soul. When you keep them focused on the finish line, not just the race, but the destination, which is Jesus himself. That's when you win. So in Jesus' name, I release a spirit of overcoming into you. The spirit of overcoming. No victim spirit will rest anymore. And in Jesus' name, I release passion over you. In Jesus' name, I impart to you vision to see the cross every day. You see the cross everywhere you walk. You see the cross every soul that's in front of you. You see the cross. And I bless you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to run, to run, to run the race put before you. Father, I anoint their eyes now. And I ask you, Holy Spirit, to confirm this with peace on every single body. From just in front of me all the way to those who couldn't reach the, the front here. Holy Spirit, settle on their eyes now. Red mist. Settle right now. Red mist. A deliberate focus. On the destination. Father, settle right on, the, right on their eyes. Red mist. Red mist. Red mist. And Lord Jesus, we choose today to give you our eyes. And we say, focus us. That like that old hymn, the things of earth would go st strangely dim in the light of your glory, God. The things of, of the drive today and tomorrow would grow strangely dim in comparison to your incredible light and your incredible passion for us, your love affair with us. I release to you, freely I was given the passion to follow, to victor in Christ's name, and I release that to you now. I give it to you freely. Receive it. Just receive it in your spirit right now. Receive it right in your spirit. Ministry team, you're released to go and help with connections. Please go and help with connections. But guys, you guys here at the front, you guys and girls, I just really feel to remind you that you're not going to have to conjure up this red mist yourself. You can't do it on your own strength. You really can't. You know, Linda was talking about loving, and we love God because He first loved us. And He's going to give you the red mist. And He's going to be the one that's going to empower you. And when you're feeling weak, and when you're feeling tired, and when you're feeling as though you don't have anything to give, He's going to be the one that puts that passion in front of you. So, Father, I pray that you just come now and you change every attitude that says, I've got to do this myself. I've got to be the one running the race. I've got to be the one finding the energy. And, Father, I pray that you just, yeah, guys, just release that burden. Just say, Father, I give it to you because I don't have it. I don't have it all together and I don't have the energy. Wow. 
He's going to run through you. And girls, I I want to speak to you directly. I want you to know that you have something to give. And very often, you know, in churches, some of you will have experienced churches where the guys are up front. But I want to call in your hearts today because God made women after his image as well. And he made you with beautiful, beautiful, vulnerable hearts. And very often the world has been telling us recently, you know, You've got to be strong. You're in a man's world and you've got to be a man. But that's not who God's calling you to be. He's not calling you to walk in the role of the man. He's calling you to walk in the role of the woman. And your compassion is something that can reach people. Your compassion is something that will propel you to pray, that will propel you just to get at God's feet and say, I need you, Papa. So I want to bless you to be open. I want to bless each one of you to be transparent. And I call you to be transparent. I call you to wear your heart on your sleeve. And I call you to cry when God, you know, God's stirring up those emotions. And I impart a vulnerability to you. I impart transparency into you. And I impart to you just being strong as who you're created to be. Because you have an identity. Each one of you have a firm identity, and it's not in the role of a man. It's in the role of being a woman, and being beautiful, and being okay with that, and being pure, and being protected by your papa. He's not going to leave you exposed. And saying no to what the world is calling you to. The world's calling you to be some woman, but God is calling you to be a lady. He's calling you to be beautiful. There's just one more category of people that before we, before we end, which is very, very important. Equally as important as all the categories that have gone before. And that is the category of the lawman. Many of you, if you're really honest with yourselves, I know I, in my own life, when I'm honest with myself, I realize that there's a huge part of me that, you know, it's, I've got to get this right. I've got to get that right. I've got to do this right. And if I see people that, that, that are not doing it right, I'm like, oh, gosh, they're, wow, they're, I don't like what they're doing. Oh, oh, they shouldn't be doing that. And hey, 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 cut that out. And of course, what that leads to is a lot of gossip behind people's backs about the way they are and what they do. And, you know, this to acknowledge that this is something that you want God to sort out in your life is going to be brave for you in this room. But let me tell you something, don't worry, because if anybody looks at you and judges you, then they're the very person that should be responding to the altar call. Right? So you're going to be intimidated to put your hand up when I ask, but you know what? I want you to be brave hearted and I want you to realize that, you know, this is a safe place and God wants to set you free from being a lawman to being God's man. I loved what Andrew said when he said that. From being a lawman to being a, to being a grace man to being God's man. And whether you're a guy or a girl, if you're in this room and you know that your walk with God and Christianity is all about, you know, how you look, how you dress, what you say, this and that, rules and regulations. I just want you to hold up your hand to Jesus because you're going to get set free. That's it. Thank you for being brave. Don't, don't, don't be ashamed. Hold it up because that's the end of, of... It's going to be the end right now anyway. So it doesn't matter what's happened in the past because by holding up your hand you're saying, I, I'm never going to be like this again anyway. So who cares? Those of you that have got your hands up, I'm going to hand over to Andrew. He's going to pray into that and break that off of you. I just want to include people that in your heart you say, God, I'm hungry for purity. I don't want to have to work for the purity that you bought for me. That free gift that you're offering me every day, that no condemnation, I want that. I want to live in that. 
I don't want to work for my Christianity because it's just so pointless. Can you raise your hands nice and high? With your eyes closed, if that's you. Yeah. Spirit of God is in this place right now. And Papa, I ask that right now you begin to break down those walls of condemnation on people. In the name of Jesus, we stand on your word where it says, There is therefore now no condemnation for them that are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. And so I say that sin has no more power in you. It's like a language that you don't even speak anymore. It's like God has changed your citizenship and you don't, you don't belong to that country anymore. You can't even get in there. You don't understand its customs. You don't understand the way they speak. You're not part of the country of sin anymore. Your identity has been changed in the name of Jesus. Wow. God right now is restoring identity. Guys, lift up your hands, guys. Yo, Papa, I ask right now that for restoration of identity. You are a man of God. You were created for purity and holiness. You were not created to be some weird sexual being. You weren't created to have some huge mega sexual thing. That's not, that's not the way God created you to be. You were not created to be ruled by sex. I just break that lie over you, over every man in this place. And I say that your body is the temple of the Lord. You were created for holiness. And you are a righteous man of God if you have said that Jesus is your Lord. I just say that you are righteous. Right now, the Father is coming and bringing identity to every man in this building. Every man. Just receive that identity. That sense of identity. That sense of ownership that the Lord is putting on you. He says, you know what, boy? I accept you. I love you so much. You're not pure because you've acted pure. You're pure because of what my son has done for you. Just come, Papa. Bring that identity right now. Right now. Every woman in this place, I speak to you and I say that you're created with purpose, with destiny, and with beauty. Wow. And every false identity now falls to the ground in the name of Jesus. We just break every false identity that says you're not good enough, that you're ugly, that you have to be some some weird sexual being that you have to put your body out there to be seen or to be or to have meaning or to have purpose I just break that lie over you that's not the case you're created with purpose and with beauty wow yeah so Holy Spirit right now I ask that you would cause us to lay aside all that law all those works all those things we try and do to impress the people around us or to try and impress you We say we do not want that anymore. Just with your own words, to say that to the Lord. Father, I don't want to walk in false law. To say that in your own way. I don't want to act like a Christian. I don't want to try and make it on my own way. Just say that. Confess it with your mouth. We don't want to do that anymore, Papa. But we claim what Jesus did. We claim the power of the cross. And we say that that makes us pure. That makes us holy. That gives us our identity in Christ. We are whole. We are righteous. We are holy. We are pure. We are clean because of Jesus. Every man in this place is clean because of Jesus. Yeah. And all condemnation falls off in the name of Jesus. Father, help us to live not in the law, but in love. In the passion that Linda was talking about, Papa. We want to live in that love. In that love every day. And I just speak an increase of passion into all of your hearts right now. An increase of intimacy. I ask, Father, that you would increase their desire for intimacy and their capacity for intimacy right now. Yo! Increase their capacity for intimacy. I just see the Lord enlarging your heart. Guys, in this place, you were created for intimacy. And our world tells us, guys, that you're not supposed to be intimate or that intimacy with men is a weird thing. The Lord has called you to be intimate. He built your heart for love. He didn't build you to be some macho jerk. God built you to be a son, to be a lover. And I bless you. And Father, I ask right now for an impartation of like the lover anointing. That these men would become radical lovers of you. Every young man in this place, that they would become a radical lover of you, Lord. That they would be so sold out. And so, like just a reckless abandon of love for you, Lord. That says, I am going to count every cost and go for you, Jesus. Because you are the pearl of great price. And there is nothing that compares to you. Every man in this place, I speak to you now. And I say, rise up in intimacy. Rise up in love. Rise up in what you were created for. Because you were created for intimacy. You were created for intimacy. Yo! You were created for intimacy. Oh, and every woman in this place, I say you were created for intimacy with the Father. 
intimacy with the Father. Holy Spirit, I pray you show us areas in our lives where we seek intimacy in the wrong places. Father, show us those places that we seek intimacy that are not from you. And I pray you would cut those off in the name of Jesus. Expose all of those places, Papa. All of those places. We want to be sold out for you as a generation, men and women. Father, we don't care about our age. We don't care about religion. We don't care about acting like Christians. We want to be so in love with you that nothing else matters. Wow, that nothing else matters. Increase that passion right now. Increase that passion right now, Father. Increase it. Increase it. Increase it. Increase that passion right now. Guys, Holy Spirit's not done yet. Just keep on pressing in. Close your eyes. Keep on pressing in. Holy Spirit still has more for you right now. I feel like He's going to be speaking specific things to your heart right in this moment. Like about your identity. Like, did you know I always loved you? Did you know I loved that thing about you? Let's just take a couple seconds and listen to the Holy Spirit's voice. He is speaking right to you right now. Let's all just close our eyes. Yeah. Guys, stop talking for a second and just listen. The Holy Spirit is speaking something specific to your heart right now. Just come, Papa. Listen to His voice. Keep on listening, guys. For some of you, this is like a rare thing. You're not used to hearing God speak. And some of you are saying, I love you a lot. A lot. A lot. So much. Just speak, Papa. Just speak. We see our hearts are wide open. We want to hear what you say about us. I feel like he's he's singing over you guys today. I'm not really a great singer, but I wanna I'm just gonna express what I feel like he's saying. So if you could close your eyes. stop loving you no I'm never gonna stop loving you every day of your life I just wanna show you how much you mean to me how much you mean to me I love you speaking that to you. I love you, my son. I love you, my daughter. I love everything about you. I love your dreams. I love your desires. I love the things you love. And even when others have said that you're not worth it or you don't deserve it, I choose you. Your papa's saying that to you today. I choose you. You don't choose me. I choose you today. I choose you. Above all others, I choose you today, my son, my daughter. Before the foundation of the universe, I was thinking, I can't wait for that guy. I can't wait for that little girl. I can't wait till they know how much I love them. Your father's saying, you know what? You're the apple of my eye. You are the apple of my eye. You're like the spring in his step. You're your father's happy thought. Thank you for that identity, Father. 
Thank you, Papa. Thank you that you're good. You're good. You are good. You're good to me. You are good. You're good. You are good. You're good. You're good, Daddy. You're the best. You're good. And I hear, I hear the, the voice of the Father saying to you this afternoon, each one of you, you are good. You are good. You're good. You're good. You're good. You're good. You are good. Daddy says you're good. You're good. You're good. You're good. I paid the highest price for you. You are good. You're good. And I lift off of you that false shame, that false identity that would say that You're a sinner. No, you're not a sinner. You're born again and you're good. You were a sinner. But I made you brand new. And you're good. You're good. You're good. You're good. You're good. You are good. How good? Very good. Very, very, very good. That's what you are. Well, I'm going to officially end this meeting. It's five o'clock and you have two and a half hours. We've only just begun. You have two and a half hours to go and relax and Hang out with some new friends, old friends, catch up with each other. And we look forward to seeing you back here at 7.30. We're going to have a rip-roaring meeting tonight. AJ Mallet is going to be speaking tonight. It's going to be absolutely incredible. The Holy Spirit's going to be here. The Father's going to be here. And Jesus is going to be here. And we're all going to be here. Let's give the Lord a big hand because I think it's been an awesome afternoon. God bless you. Thank you for coming. See you tonight.